Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar entitled Science, Curiosity, and Classical Education. Thank you to everyone who has taken time out of your day to attend this webinar and learn more about the unique relationship between science and classical education. For science taught classically can help students cultivate joy and wonder about the beautiful world we live in. For anyone who does not know me, my name is Winston Brady, and I'm a humanities teacher at Thales Academy Rollsville and the director of Thales Press. The goal of these webinars is twofold. First, to create a space for teachers, real teachers to share real tips and real insights that can help us all become better, more effective educators. And the second is to encourage everyone on this webinar, teachers, parents, and students all alike to love the things that are worth loving. Great books, good conversations, meaningful relationships, in short, everything that makes up the nature of the good life. I mean, that is why we got into teaching in the first place, isn't it? I'm joined here by Matt Ogle, the assistant administrator at our Thales Rollsville campus. Matt is a rare find amongst classical teachers and leaders, someone who is steeped in not only the great books, but also great science. To give a brief introduction, Matt was born in England and has years of experience as a science teacher, but he also has a deep appreciation for the values and virtues of classical education. And today, Matt is going to walk us through a sample lesson and explain his unique approach to teaching science, one rooted in the kind of classical pedagogy that helped shape the minds of individuals like Galileo, Newton, and the like. Now, as far as housekeeping details, this webinar is being recorded. It's gonna be released on our Thales Press YouTube channel, as well as our Developing Classical Thinkers podcast. And we'll email these resources out to everybody who's registered once they're ready. But that way, you can easily find these resources once everything is said and done. Q&A will follow after Matt has finished explaining his lecture and sample lesson plan. And for any of our Zoom participants, you can, and in fact, you'll be encouraged to type your questions into the special Q&A box. At the end of today's webinar, if there's any remaining questions, we can go ahead and take those. We should have some time for Q&A, and I can administer that once everything is said and done. Matt, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you again so much for preparing this talk and sharing your insights with other like-minded classical educators. Thank you, Mr. Brady. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to share on this. And um, I wanna go back to a statement you made about the important relationship between classical education and, and uh, science. Uh, because as I've grown up in the world of science teaching, I believe that you know, the science is really the epitome of what the liberal arts can produce because there's no other discipline that quite demands as much of, of a student. You, you must be able to read, uh, write well, uh, uh, navigate data analysis, uh, draw meaningful conclusions, all with critical reasoning skills that, that I think um, the classical education really provides you. And so, um, while there may seem to be a little bit of a disconnect between say modern science and classical education, I, I don't think that the disconnect is, exists in reality because the skills that you learn through, through scientific study um, are really benefit the, the classical mind and vice versa. Um, I do have some goals in particular for today, and that would be to, to share with you a science lesson. This is, this is one that I've used in biology classes, particularly a 10th grade biology class a few years ago. I developed this lesson um, really with the, the mindset of how, how can we uh, instill a, a classical sense of wonder and, and intrigue and curiosity that will drive um, the discovery process. Um, and I found that, that one of the best ways to do that is to present interesting information, present interesting cases and the more that I've uh, taught science, the more I've deferred to just looking at real life examples of things, um, sharing those with students and working through the process of figuring out what that, these uh, studies have to share, or have, sorry, have to say to us. Um, 
So I'm really hoping to capitalize on that idea that if you can instill a sense of curiosity in students, uh, that they will stick with you through a lesson and actually enjoy um, the process of learning. One of the things I found important is to minimize in this instance, the, the use of lecture. And I'm, I'm giving a little lecture as an introduction now, but I'll soon switch into more of a teaching uh, style where it's uh, intended to be more um, question and answer, more discussion based. Um, I do find lecture important, but lecture is a fairly passive method of, of gathering information. And um, in, a, in a lesson like this, I want the students actively engaged. Uh, and so I'll only really use lecture momentarily just, just to define things, but only at the point at which the student should have already picked up on, on certain key details uh, before I have to, to say them clearly. And uh, this lesson is designed around a, an actual study, a biological study, a research study using real data uh, to demonstrate real principles. And, and uh, one of the things I would like to emphasize in classical education, we, we often hearken back to primary sources, uh, use primary sources in the classroom um, and, and believe in those. And I think in science, what we need to consider primary sources are great studies um, that contain real data uh, that can help to illustrate real principles. Um, that's one aspect of a primary source in, in science. And just as I would encourage a history teacher to go to the original documents um, and read them for themselves, I would encourage a science teacher, go to the actual studies, <laughs> read those studies for yourself, um, glean from them and share, share those uh, with students um, so that you can use them as a tool for, for learning. Um, and most importantly, uh, because of that method of, of discussion, my goal is to provoke a conversation today. So, I'll see if I can get you interested in something that may be ordinary and commonplace to many of you, uh, but I want to introduce you to the Virginia opossum. Um, I actually saw one on the road today. Unfortunately, it had been uh, hit by a car, uh, but incredibly common in North Carolina and in, in this area. One of the things that I love about biology in particular is that um, you can take a lesson from something seemingly ordinary and commonplace, such as an opossum. And, and when, you, when you learn to study it, when you learn to dig into the data, when you learn to look into the background, you can actually find that there's some truly remarkable things. And taking the light in those average ordinary things um, is a special, special opportunity we have um, in, in the sciences. Um, so my first question, and this is how I might introduce uh, this lesson uh, to students, is um, do you know anything about the Virginia opossum? This is the opossum that you would see around this area. On this slide, you'll see a uh, bottom right corner, a map of its home range, all the way from Panama um, up to the northern United States, maybe even into Canada at this, at this point. And so just to, just to get the ball rolling, I would, I would ask, does anybody know anything that makes the Virginia opossum a particularly interesting and unique organism? If you have an answer, uh, feel free to type it into the chat message um, or the Q&A, um, and Mr. Brady will field those, help me to field those questions and see if anybody uh, does know anything um, about the opossum. I'll give you a second to think. Um, but but uh, uh, by my last means of introduction, what I would say is this lesson I would use as part of an ecology unit uh, to, to talk about how the interaction between living things and their environment affects each other. Um, I would use it as an introduction to adaptation to the environment um, as an, or also as an example of how to just analyze biological data and understand it better. So with that in mind, I gave you a second to think. Anyone have any uh, knowledge about the Virginia opossum, anything that makes it unusual. Let's see, they are nocturnal, someone said. That's right, um, primarily nocturnal. Um, they do play dead as a way to avoid becoming prey. Yes, they play possum, a really fascinating, uh, fascinating defense mechanism that when startled, they can, not only do they play dead, but they emit an odor that, that smells like rotting flesh to put off a potential uh, predator from eating it. Um, 
It's a really remarkable. A couple other things about it. It is uh, one of the, the, or I should say, the only marsupial animal that's native to, the, to North America and the most northerly marsupial in the world as well. Um, yes, I, I was just saying there, someone else mentioned that they were marsupials. Um, most northerly marsupial in the world and very adaptable. In fact, if you look at its home range, notice that, that it can survive anywhere from the jungles of South America up to uh, the rainforests of the Pacific Northwest or the, um, the deciduous forests up in New England and so on. Uh, can anyone say, for looking at the map, where do they not like to live? What conditions do they not, do they not seem to appreciate? Yes, deserts, deserts. Uh, cold areas, high mountains, look, they, they uh, don't like the Rocky Mountains. They're fine in the Appalachian Mountains. Anyone know the difference between uh, conditions in the Rockies versus the Appalachian Mountains? Yes, they're drier, colder. The Rocky Mountains uh, also, right, uh, Appalachians lower elevation, Rocky Mountains much higher. Because of the higher elevation, there's no trees. One of the common things in this picture of the, of the opossum even indicates it, right? One of the common features of opossums is that they love trees. Um, as long as there is a forest for them to live in, uh, they seem quite happy. Um, some other things that, that you don't know, these are some of your best friends in your backyard. Uh, a possum is known to eat up to 10,000 ticks per day um, under the right conditions, and they love to eat the things that we don't like, ticks, spiders, uh, cockroaches, the things that we consider pests around our houses, they consider fine dining. So if you have one in your backyard, um, you're either lucky or unlucky, depending on how you look at that, <laughs> that situation. It means there's a lot for them to eat, but they're, they're, uh, they love to be around there. Um, and then the last thing I would say is that opossum is known, uh, the opossum is known for having an incredibly strong immune system. Um, there is very little that can make an opossum sick, and they very rarely die of sickness. Um, they, they die from predation or from accidents, um, but rarely do they get sick. Um, and I throw that out there now just uh, as something to keep in the back of your mind for later. Um, but it's a known fact about the opossum, something fairly um, overlooked. Um, but here's, here's what the lesson is intended to model. We have this, this extraordinary animal that lives over a vast range of territories. Um, and we know instinctively, if we look at that map, that the conditions that the opossum lives in do vary quite a bit. Uh, so one question that we might have, and it's the question of, of this um, lesson, is does the, does the home location, does the, the place where the uh, possum lives affect in any way its appearance? Um, because that's something in biology that, that we study, that we look at. Do, does the organism adapt and change in order to uh, suit its surroundings? And so one good question to ask is, over the course of this range, can we find any correlations between um, location and appearance? Instead of the word appearance, you may see me, or in this study, use the word phenotype. If you had been in my biology class up till now, you would know that phenotype is the biological term for appearance. Uh, so if I use those terms interchangeably, uh, don't be afraid. Okay, so first thing to establish is, is there a variety of appearances in the Virginia opossum across its range. Can anyone here, I'm looking at this selection of pictures, there's only five here, um, but there are some things that you could probably write in a quick chat message. What are some of the varieties that you see um, in appearance here? And I'll read them out if you enter them. Yes, a difference in fur color, that one stands out quickly. Some are lighter than others, some are darker. Um, Patterns on the faces. In particular, you'll see that black stripe running down the, the forehead and onto the nose um, does tend to vary. Yeah, uh, density of fur. Yes, that, that uh, would hopefully, you would see a link between maybe the climates. Um, now looking again at the, at the pictures, can you see any connection between the environment maybe and some of these, some of these um, distinctions that you're seeing? Actually, I just wrote, yes, lighter fur in the snowier pictures. I think that's true. The one in the bottom left is more grizzled. The one on the bottom right is definitely much lighter in color than the rest in the snowier pictures. And contrast that with the opossum in the top right. 
where you have citrus fruit. Citrus fruit is subtropical, so that's going to be a warmer environment. So the warmer environment, potentially, we're looking at a much darker color, colder environment, much lighter color. Um, for, for density, yes, you're right. For density, probably changes over the course of that um, range as well as a result. Um, and if we hone in on some of these characteristics, this is why we start to see, is there a pattern? So now we get, an, we get a glimpse of it, right? We get a glimpse that maybe there's a pattern here between fur color and fur density and the environment. So the next step, next logical step is, can we do a study to determine this, is this a real pattern or is it a coincidence? Are these pictures here representative or are they coincidental? Um, and so uh, the study that this presentation and lesson is based on did that. Uh, over the range of this um, opossum's uh, habitat, it studied 300 sample opossums measuring various aspects of body size, um, body type, body color, and so on to determine whether or not there is a connection between the location and the appearance of the, of the opossum, or is it, is it more random? Uh, these dots on this map represent the locations where the opossum were selected. For the purpose of this study, museum samples were used um, that, were, that had a known location, a known origin, um, and there was a comparison done um, between these particular opossum. One last thing to note as well is that uh, we can measure, um, one measurement I should say of, of location is latitude. Uh, latitude being a measurement away from the equator. So the higher the latitude number, the more northerly uh, the opossum is. Um, and so we have this, this connection, right? I, uh, body types, body colors, and then latitude. Can we see a connection between those? Latitude is probably the single biggest driving factor in determining the conditions in which the, the opossum would live, whether they're warm, cold, um, snowy, um, humid, and so on. Now, in this study, uh, in the links that we've provided, there is a, um, a handout that contains some similar information to this. And the sort of questions I've been asking here, I would pause periodically during the lesson and, and ask students to fill in certain questions with their own understanding. Now, um, is there a possibility for these links? How can we figure it out? Um, we're running through that fairly quickly because we're going to get to the, the actual data of the experiment. In the student handout, the, 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 the next couple of slides show samples of the, the data, um, and I've provided copies for that in the student handout as well so that students can have a close look at it. And uh, it takes a minute to get used to it. So let's take a look at the first three um, plots of data here. And this shows some similarity. Notice that the, the x axis, the horizontal axis, is in uh, degrees latitude. So the further right you go on the diagram, the closer you are to the northernmost tip of the opossum range um, near Canada. The further south you go uh, to the left of the diagram, the closer you are to Panama on the southern end of the range. And then on the, the y-axis, you have what's being measured. And this first one, this is a these are measurements of body type. First one uh, shows body length, second one hind foot length, and the third one is tail length. And one of the first things I would ask students to do is, is look at this and look at the line of best fit that tries to summarize what the data is saying. You can see each graph is a scatter plot, but there's the line of best fit. And is there some kind of relationship? Do, does one increase or decrease in correspondence to the other one? And I would argue on this, and just to, to get you that the middle graph has a very weak relationship but that the first and the last graphs do actually show something important. The first one shows that the, the more northerly you go in the range of the opossum, the longer the body of the opossum gets. Body length seems to increase with latitude. And, and conversely, tail length actually seems to decrease. Tails seem to get shorter as you go more northerly. I'm going to assume that everybody agrees. Second set of data shows uh, ear length. The first one is ear length. And you can see a weak relationship here between ear length. Ear length uh, stays about the same until you get to around 33 degrees and then begins to rapidly decrease the length of the ears. Tail pigmentation, that's an interesting one. Notice how the more northerly you get, 
the um, lighter the tails of the opossum appear, right? The pigment percentage pigmentation decreases quite a bit. And the same with the ears, ear pigmentation, it starts off fairly high, but decreases as you get um, towards more northerly latitudes. So the tails and the ears tend to show this, this relationship that we identified in the pictures, right? That you get a lighter color with increased latitude. Ear length shows some decrease with latitude. So if I could summarize so far, we've said body length increases, tail length and ear length decrease with latitude, and the tails and ears get lighter in color. The next set, these are all about toes and noses, right? Notice that the pigmentation of the toes um, tends to decrease with latitude, shows a little bit of an increase um, uh, in both cases uh, beyond about 40 degrees. And then rostrum, rostrum is the, the elongated nose of the opossum. Um, the rostrum tends to get much lighter as the uh, opossum lives in a more northerly area. So there's some lightening of the toes, but there's a definite lightening of the nose. And then one of the last things we should look at is the face, the body of the, of the um, opossum. And here we have temporal lightness, that's the side of the head, cheeks on the sides of the face, both show a strong correlation with lightness, lightening, I should say, as uh, latitude increases. And then torso, that's the main body of the, the animals. So, so actually what we find by doing the study, what we find is that our initial impressions of those pictures probably pointed us in the right direction, that, that as the opossum lives in a more northerly latitude, it tends to get lighter in color. But then also notice that it tends to get slightly longer in body, but shorter in terms of its tail, its ears, and to some extent, its feet, although the relationship was weaker um, with feet, okay? So with that in mind, see who can be the fastest to answer this question. Based on these observations, looking at the picture of this opossum, where would you expect this one to, to live in terms of its overall range? Higher up, north, east coast, north, right. Exactly. This is a, probably uh, towards the northerly extent of the opossum's range, lighter in color, longer body. Um, if, if we could compare it to others, we would see shorter tail, uh, shorter ears, and so on. Okay, good. So you have the, uh, the basics here down. We see these rules. Um, the next question really, and, and to, to go deeper into this study, we would then want to really try to figure out, is there a reason for this? Is there, is there a reason why the, these rules are in place for the opossum? Is there some, something that in the environment or something about the locations uh, that maybe dictates uh, these changes that we can see and that we can, we can actually graph, we can measure and we can see demonstrably that there are changes in appearance over the course of these animals range. So now what I would do is turn to this. This is the abstract of the study that this um, is based on. And um, in class, I, I can tell you, I would spend a lot of time reading um, and discussing this abstract in order to really understand what this study is all about. It's a beautifully written two paragraph summary of this study full of biological terms that we can parse out to understand uh, this relationship. But what I'd like you to focus uh, your attention on just for the sake of time is the first sentence of the second paragraph. We found that despite the recent expansion into temperate environments, the phenotypic variation in the Virginia opossum follows a latitudinal gradient fitting three adaptive ecogeographic patterns codified under Bergman's, Allen's, and Gloger's rules. Or in other words, the phenotype variation, that's the variation in appearance of the Virginia opossum seems to change along latitudes, right? Depending on the latitude and it fits a gradient and it happens to follow three known patterns in biology known as Bergman, Allen's and Gloger's rule of ecogeographic patterns. And ecogeographic, that's a word that we would have to break down, but eco short for ecology, that's the interaction of living things with the environment. And geographic means that the geographic location is important uh, to understanding these rules. So before we go any further, here is where I would stop and define. 
is now suddenly this, this study is introducing an important idea to us that there are patterns here that can be found in nature. These opossums just happen to demonstrate these patterns, but these are three things worth noting. And here I would stop and give lecture and we would probably note all of these things. I would define these rules. But having done work through this study, we've already seen these rules in operation. Bergman's rule states that populations and species of larger size are found in colder environments and smaller size are found in warmer regions. Remember, one of the things we identified is that the body length of these opossums gets larger as you go more to the north, which follows Bergman's rule, larger size, colder environments, small size, warmer environments. Allen's rule says that the limbs, the ears, the appendages, think tails of these animals tend to be shorter in cold climates and longer in warm climates. We saw that with the opossum, the ears, the tails, to some extent, the feet got shorter as you went more north where it's colder. And Gloger's rule says that within families of endotherms, warm-blooded organisms, heavily pigmented forms tend to be found in more humid environments. Now this one may cause you to pause for a moment because that may be unexpected. All right, if I were to ask you, why does the color of the opossum get lighter as you go more north? What's your natural response? Anybody? To blend in, right, good, camouflage, snow, climates, white background, right? So our natural inclination is to think whiter color equals snowy environment, right, paler environment. That's not what Gloger's rule says, and this is why this study is really interesting and worth pointing, atten pointing out. Gloger's rule says that heavily pigmented forms tend to be found in more humid environments. Um, the snow, the cold, is actually considered a very dry environment. It's like the inside of your refrigerator. All of the moisture in the air has frozen out of it, so it's a fairly dry um, environment. And actually, this is one of the driving reasons why pigmentation tends to decrease. Here we have another example on this picture. These are just drawings, but it represents four types of common hair in the United States. If you go far enough north, maybe not in the United States, we'd have to include Canada to find the Arctic hair. But if you go far enough north, you find the Arctic hair. And then if you go far enough south into the American Southwest, you find the antelope jackrabbit. Now notice, that both of those organisms are fairly light in color. But what do deserts and the Arctic have in common? They're dry environments. So interestingly, pigmentation seems to follow humidity, um, even though we would assume, yeah, desert environment, you wanna be paler to blend in. That may be just a side effect. That may just be an added benefit. The connection between the two seems to be humidity. What else do you notice about these rabbits? Uh, how else do they follow these rules, do you think? Can you see any other obvious connections? The ear shapes, someone writes, yep. Notice that the more northerly the rabbit, the Arctic hare uh, has the shorter ears. Um, the longer ears seem to be in the hotter uh, environments, yeah. Um, you can also notice appendage length, right? not just the ears, but the length of the legs seems to decrease. And if you were to be able to pick up these hairs, you would find that the um, antelope jackrabbit in the desert environment is a fairly slender, thin hair, whereas the Arctic hair is fairly large. In fact, Kristen Adams just pointed that out. The Arctic rabbit is much larger, fatter um, than the Arctic hair than the others. I have another example for you um, to look at. Exact, uh, shows the same kind of patterns. Let's see if you can remember them here. Um, Arctic fox, red fox, fennec fox. Notice that the distribution of these animals, um, depending on latitude, tends to affect the color. Is the Arctic fox white to blend in with its snowy environment? I think that's a benefit. But actually what we can say is that the Arctic fox lives in a very dry environment and is very pale in color. Notice the ears are much shorter. And again, if you could see these things side by side, the Arctic fox, in fact, the little pictures on the right uh, show this, the Arctic fox, shorter legs, um, heavier body um, than the typical European red fox. 
But here's an illustration of that rule about humidity. Remember, Glover's rule says that pigmentation relates to humidity. And notice here that the most heavily pigmented form of the fox, the red fox, lives in the temperate environments that are much more humid than either the Arctic or the desert. So here again, we see heavy pigmentation related to humidity. Interesting. Finally, uh, before I go on to that, let me ask you this, because uh, this is a question that many of you could probably answer. Why are these things important? Probably intuitively, we, we may be able to figure out why these, why these um, patterns exist. So let's take them one at a time. The first one, Bergman's rule says that your body gets bigger as the temperature decreases or as you go more northerly in latitude. Does anyone know why that's important? Can you, can you share a reason? Why do you need a larger body in a colder climate? Yeah, body heat is one reason more mass for more insulation. Yep. And then what, all, what else do um, Arctic animals have to do in order to prepare for the winter? They have to eat, right. Right, so they have to fatten up when food is available in order to survive the long periods of time when food is not. So larger body size tends to follow, um, tends to follow the environment. We could also relate this to sea animals, right? Sea animals need to conserve heat they tend to be much larger body size than, than a corresponding land animal. So interesting. All right, that was uh, Bergman's rule. Allen's rule says that the appendages, the, the length of the tail, the length of the feet, the length of the nose and the ears gets shorter as you get into colder environments or longer and warmer environments. Does anyone know the reason for that? Why, why does the appendage length change? Yeah, retain heat and energy. It is related to that. The, uh, ears and nose and feet, the, ex the extremities um, are, are the main way that, a, that an organism loses heat or controls heat lost from its body. Yes, the blood circulation uh, through the ears and the tails is important there. So in a hot environment, you're, you, you want to lose heat <laughs> as much as possible. So you have larger appendages like this Phoenix fox ears, larger appendages. Does it help it here a little bit better perhaps? Uh, but part of the reason for it is also that these ears help uh, heat to dissipate from the body of the fox um, that it, uh, in the environment that it lives in, the desert. Um, whereas the Arctic fox wants to conserve body heat so it has shorter ears, thicker fur, and so on. So the remaining one is, Alan, is uh, sorry, Gloger's rule, which is this relationship between pigmentation and humidity. And our natural instinct is to think of camouflage, but this this study is fascinating because it points out a completely different reason why this relationship might exist. And that's what I want to uh, share with you here. Uh, it's highlighted in the, in the box. The results indicate that the adaptive mechanism underlying the variation in body size, extremity size, and pigmentation are related to resource seasonality, heat conservation, and pathogen resistance hypotheses, respectively. Or in other words, body size is related to resource seasonality. If you need to fatten up for the winter because of seasonal resources, um, then you have a larger body size. Extremity size is related to heat conservation. But here's the fascinating thing. Pigmentation is related to pathogen resistance. I don't know about you, but the first time I saw this study, I was taken aback. Pathogen resistance. I thought that was fascinating. And then I, you know, I start to think, where do all of your really virulent diseases take place? Tropical environments, typically. Temperate environments that are very humid. So we know that there's this relationship. First of all, Allen's rule, sorry, Gloger's rule about, about humidity has been known for a long time. But what's, what is the key reason for the humidity factor? It's very well, a recent idea in biology is that it's related to pathogen resistance. Or in other words, where you're, where you're exposed to more pathogens in a warm, humid environment, you need a stronger immune system, and that is indicated by more heavy pigmentation. To me, that's like a, a groundbreaking, stunning idea that I never thought of before. Why is this? 
Why does this hypothesis even exist? You know why? Because of the humble Virginia opossum, known to have an incredibly powerful immune system, but its immune system changes in relation to the pigmentation of its body. The darker the pigmentation of the, of the opossum, the, the stronger its immune response seems to be to pathogens. Fascinating idea. This idea has become really important in biology. If you were to Google it um, later on, if you were to Google the relationship between pigmentation and pathogen resistance, you'll see that the same pattern seems to be occurring in plants. The same pattern seems to be occurring in insects as well. And uh, uh, you, that's a great question, Winston. Is it related to the fact that crows and vultures have to have black or have black feathers? Is their dark pigmentation a result of having to eat diseased organisms? Is that kind of the implication that you were coming up with? It could well be. That would be an interesting thing to find out. I have no idea, but I love the, I love the thought of it, right, in relation to this. But the same pattern has been seen. And if you think, you know, tropical diseases, very virulent, temperature, temperate diseases, stronger, um, you, the, the um, transmission of diseases decreases quite significantly in dry environments, right? As we've learned through this, through this pandemic, right? That when conditions are drier, you get less transmission of disease. And, and so in those dry environments, one reason those organisms are not as heavily pigmented is they're not fighting as much disease. Fascinating idea. I wonder which one came first. Like, is it the camouflage that's the benefit um, and the fact that they need less immune resistance uh, side effect, or is it the other way around? I'm not totally sure because the study is, is happening in real time. This is something that in biology they are, it's still considered a, a strong hypothesis, but has not yet been proven, but it seems to be the most, most likely connection. And so this humble animal, uh, this Virginia opossum has, has led to a very interesting field of study. Three things that, that I was trying to point out to, to all students taking this study is that we can see these patterns in nature and we can name them and we can describe them. And some of them seem to follow very logical rules to us that temperature seasonality causes larger body size because you have to fatten up for the winter. Temperature decreases causes limb and appendage shortening because you need to conserve heat and energy. But then pigmentation increases with humidity probably as a direct result of fighting pathogens. One thing I didn't say, but it is, has been discovered that the, the, the genes that help produce antibodies for pathogen resistance are very closely connected to the genes that produce pigmentation. I mean, physically connected, like they're on the same chromosomes in similar regions of the, of the, of the DNA. And so that could very well be why there's a connection. There's, there's like this physical connection between these two um, abilities potentially. But what an interesting idea, right? Something that probably, I hope, surprised, interrupted our thinking um, and would probably lead us to having any other, any, you know, questions and, and, and thoughts for future inquiry. Um, I'm going to, I've talked for a long time. <laughs> I wonder if anybody does have any questions. Does this provoke any thoughts, any, any feedback, any ideas? Are these the only rules for biological traits? No, not the only ones. Um, uh, there's, there's certainly a lot more that, that we could look at, uh, but these ones are fairly, fairly common and fairly intuitive. Like I think if we think of body size and limb appendage, we could, we could put together a, a list of, of organisms that would follow these traits. You know. Uh, uh, bears come to mind <laughs> quite quickly. Um, the polar bear being the largest in body size, but having the shortest appendages of the bear family. Does this carry over into humans? I wondered if someone would ask that. That is a excellent and very risky question, my friend, <laughs> uh, because uh, there are some things that, some ways that humans tend to follow um, these body patterns. Uh, but in order to study those, you really have to look at indigenous peoples um, that, are, that are closely connected to their environments. And, and um, socio-politically, it, it can be quite a minefield to try to draw these sort of connections uh, to human populations. Any other thoughts?
last thing I would have my students do as a as an exercise um, in this, and you'll see it in the in the worksheet that that we provided through the links, um, is that I believe in this in this lesson uh, that Richard Feynman, the great physics teacher, once taught. Um, uh, well, you know, one step before him, C.S. Lewis once said um, that in, in order to, to know that you've actually learned something, you have to be able to share it with someone else, teach it to someone else. Uh, Richard Feynman, the physics teacher, took it one step further and said, to know that you actually have learned something, you need to be able to share it with a six-year-old. So that's a really interesting challenge. But it's something that I do routinely with my students. So you would see that the sort of summative exercise that, that I would set my students to do is to look at the abstract of that article that, that I shared with you and to translate that abstract into common everyday language that even a fifth grader, I challenge them, maybe not a six-year-old, but I challenge them, can you write it so that a fifth grader could understand um, what this study is trying to show? Because I think even a fifth grader would be interested in learning about these patterns and seeing these things demonstrated and would be curious about this final one, this one that seems a little, a little more um, uh, ambiguous than the others and worthy of further uh, attention. And so that's the challenge that I would give my students. Not only can you summarize this study, but can you put it in everyday terms um, so that someone else could learn? Um, that's really the end of the lesson. Now, it would take longer to do in person with my students. We'd take a little more time. We would read uh, through the information a little more heavily. It might even take one of our block periods here, a uh, double class period, or I might spread it over a couple lessons. Um, but by the end of this, I'm pretty confident that my students would not only be interested in finding out more, um, but that if they began with curiosity, their curiosity has only been deepened by, by learning about these fascinating things that can be found in nature. I hope that would be the case for you as well, um, that you may not even known that you're interested in this, but I hope that you would go from here wanting to find out just a little bit more um, about the studies here. That's really the end of my presentation. Be happy to field any uh, questions um, that we might have. And Winston, I don't know if you want to introduce that that portion of the webinar. Well, Matt, I think I speak for everyone. This was fascinating. This was really, really interesting and engaging. I I I knew that possums were the deep down on principle. I knew that possums were this interesting, but you did an amazing job just bringing out all the intricacies, all those things that I would never notice um, as far as you know, phenotype, uh, um, length of limbs and so on. Um, we would love to field some questions now. You can continue typing those into the Zoom chat box, or you can also type them into the Q&A box that's running along the bottom of your Zoom window. Matt, I do have uh, one question to, to get us started off with while people are perhaps thinking of some of their own questions. Uh, practically, how do you set up a lesson plan like this in your science classroom? You know, um, how do you divide up the tasks and assign them to students? A, have you kind of thought of, you know, there's a number of steps for students to pick up on that big idea that uh, latitude, climate, humidity, those uh, sorts of environmental factors uh, play a huge role in uh, what that possum is going to, to look like and so on. Um, do you divide up like the different tasks here, and perhaps some of these are better for independent work, others are better for group work, others are better for uh, whole class discussions. How do you go about setting up the lesson plan so that the students can pick up on these monumental ideas for themselves? Uh, I think a clear, a clear sense of, of what we're trying to do is helpful because that then guides any questions or stu student responses, right? So if I know, um, you know, this may be different than a discussion that I would have in a Socratic seminar where, where it's more free flowing and, and, and we're able to follow a particular thread. This would be a discussion where um, I'm asking pointed questions. They're not like yes or no questions, but they're pointed towards a particular outcome. Um, so like I tried to demonstrate, um, I would, you know, say, what's your idea? Do you have, you know, do you have any background knowledge? Do you have, have you seen this before? Because many people have. Many people will connect body size to um, to resource seasonality, for example, right? So many, you can connect that idea. Um, but what I love about this article and what makes it interesting is the twist. 
right? The fact that you can't always predict uh, what something is going to say or to, to do. And so that's, I'm, I'm teaching the lesson. I, I'm not sure I've answered your question yet, but I'm teaching the lesson knowing that the twist is coming and trying to set people up for it, <laughs> um, if that makes sense. Now, what, how do I break that down in the lesson? In my lesson, sample lesson plan that, I, that, I, um, that we linked in the, there, um, you'll see that there's uh, a lot of opportunity for discussion. And some of that discussion I would do um, in just small groups. Like a, I would present maybe five minutes of information and then, um, and then ask a discussion question. And I may have, you know, say, turn to your partners, um, think about this, and then put an answer um, in the, uh, uh, then put an answer down on the page. But I wouldn't want someone working ahead too much on the, like the worksheet. Like this is a deliberate process that I'm, I'm working people through, trying to get them to, to think. So I would do this as a large group. Um, but I would I would spend some moments in small group discussion and other moments in um, in large discussions um, with the whole class, um, and um, and then I think you know that's uh, the assessment portion of it. When I said you know to have the students write it in their own terms, that's where I'm really looking for the individual students to demonstrate that they've been paying attention, that they've understood. So those last couple questions I would say need to be um, need to be. Uh, uh, independent work, reflective of the student's own thinking, not, not shared or discussed necessarily with everyone. And when I go to evaluate the lesson, I'm gonna focus more on that than on the other, um, the other questions. Those, uh, uh, those just make sure that the students have been paying attention and following along. But what I'm curious about is what every individual attains uh, from this. Um, if the discussion was live, I think, you know, it, it, here it was just done partly through through chat, but if the discussion was live, to probably better demonstrate the control process of, you know, directing directing the questions towards the end goal. Yeah. Does that make sense? Did I answer your question? Um, I have a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah, Miss Adams, Biology Corner is a fantastic resource uh, for finding this type of study. Um, this one um, I adapted from a lesson, and you'll see it in my lesson plan that I that I attribute it to that to that um, Biology Corner lesson. And there's another one uh, which I'm going to give you for bi biology lessons. It's H H H M I Biology. Um, I'm, you know, let me find the exact URL. Um, one of the best biology lesson websites I've ever discovered, um, if you're interested. Actually, it's called biointeractive.org. Um, full, the, this, uh, this um, website, biointeractive.org, is full of studies like this that can be used um, in lesson plans. And they, the varying, varying degrees of difficulty as well. Brad, question, how does technology figure into your lessons? Um, in a lesson like this, um, I'm using the technology to, to demonstrate um, the pictures, uh, to keep the students engaged. Um, I don't know that, that I'm using it much beyond that. Um, we, I would accept um, digital copies of the, the worksheet to be completed. And if I could find some supplementary videos or something that were, that were relevant, um, then then I might use you know, that in conjunction with this lesson. Um, but uh, my technology use in this case is, is pretty simple. It's limited to more just a presentation and a worksheet. Matt, I wanted to ask, what does Socratic questioning look like as you're trying to, I, you use the word controlled. Could you maybe give us an example, perhaps even going back to one of the slides where that would be a like a good demonstration of what that Socratic questioning looks like in the science classroom? Um, yeah, let me see if uh, I can go back to, uh, you know, probably probably the, the way I would use it most is in revealing this um, strange exception to the rule, right? And I would probably set it up, uh, try to set it up in, in much the same way that I did here. Why do you think this is the case? And because two out of the three rules, people are probably gonna say 
um, the right thing. And then the third one, I can predict that they're going to say camouflage because that's the natural thing for people to say. And so leading them to actually, like instead of highlighting this sentence, what, what I would have them do is work through this, this paragraph and then ask them what stood out to you. Somebody may have picked up on it already. Or I may analyze um, this where it says that they, uh, the adaptive mechanisms um, are related to respectively, and I might need to walk them through I respectively means that the first thing relates to the first, the first variable relates to the first principle, right? So body size relates to, and get them to say resource seasonality, extremity size, and I would get them to say heat conservation. So what does pigmentation relate to? And if they haven't understood this, you know, this really monumental point by then, <laughs> um, then they're not paying attention, right? Uh, but that would be, that if I could use you know, one thing as an example, it would be, can you, if someone's reading this and paying attention to it and, and working through it, they should be surprised. They should be surprised by this, this answer. And so some of them will get it right away. That would be a great discussion. Others need to be walked through with varying degrees of difficulty of questions. And if someone still doesn't get it, then I do go to that final step of let's just, let's just lay, it, lay it out plainly for you, right? Does that make sense? And then I think beyond that, once you've established that connection, the next thing would be, would be um, just uh, extrapolating from it, thinking about it, thinking of other examples of the same, the same thing. Um, and can we, can we think of this you know, for ourselves? Yeah. Um, Anna, do you use the Feynman technique the same way in your lessons that aren't related to scientific studies? Absolutely. In fact, sometimes I coach teachers. You're, you're taking too long explaining this. You need to think about how you would say it to a sixth grader, right? Can you say it in fewer terms? Uh, one of my problems with lecture is that lecture takes way too long to say things sometimes. I'm fine with a lecture that, you know, takes 15, 20 minutes and is really pointed and precise and, and to the point. If you can't say it within 20 to 25 minutes, then maybe you just don't, haven't thought it through clearly enough yet in your presentation. That sounds rather harsh, um, but it's a challenge <laughs> and it's a good challenge for us to embrace uh, clarity of thinking. Matt, we have a good question from um, Ms. Bloom over at our Apex campus. What would you suggest to students who are attending this webinar, uh, what they can do to be more successful in the science classroom? Uh, be curious. Be, uh, I, you know, the older students get, the, the more jaded they seem to come across. And I would plead, never lose your curiosity <laughs> about things. Uh, because if, uh, going back to one of the first points that I made, if, if you're observant of something that you may think is common in every, every day, like, like I said, I see opossums on the side of the road all the time. If you're curious about something, though, it can lead you to uh, broaden your understanding and deepen your understanding of something in ways that you never thought were possible. This study opened my mind to a whole new field of biology that I hadn't considered previously, and I've been studying biology. I mean, I, I discovered this four years ago, I think, and I, you know, I've been studying biology for 20, 20 years, and this was entirely new to me, and I loved it. And, and curiosity can do that for you. If, you. if you remain interested, if you remain curious, observational, and, and engaged long enough, you, will, you see the point. And that students do have a responsibility to do that, I think. I mean, after all, it's the students who are supposed to be learning from the experience, right? Um, teachers, we have a job to make information accessible, interesting, uh, capture the imagination, but students have to meet us by being open to it, by being curious, uh, by being willing to, to go down the path. Did I answer your question, Ms. Bloom? Matt, I think we've got another question too in the Q&A and we still have some time, it's only 3.54, but um, you mentioned a couple of good websites to find uh, lesson plans like this, um, but do you have any criteria 
uh, whether that's you know a very good peer-reviewed scholarly journal, uh, but someplace to find studies like this that are similar, perhaps ones that have, you know, I think all of us would want studies with more photos in them of, of, of adorable woodland creatures like these possums here. But what's some of your criteria for finding and selecting good studies? Uh, my criteria. Um, I, I think, you know, we have to be critical uh, of what we're, what we're using in the classroom. And so uh, I can recommend a couple websites. Uh, biology Corner is one. That's where I got this particular. And my specialty is biology, so I can't speak to other subjects. But if you're looking for biology lessons, Biology Corner has come a long way. They are a free website um, that uh, biology teachers post stuff. But I can tell you there is a great variety of, of content on there. My preference is always to go back to real studies that include real data um, that are not cheap substitutes. And you will find that on Biology Corner. You know, they'll have, um, one of my least favorite ones is they have this uh, unit on um, genetics using um, SpongeBob and Bikini Bottom as the, as the uh, material source. And to me, that's a waste of time. Like, why not, why not study real animals, real situations, um, uh, real data, and, and so on? That's, you know, one of my goals is, again, to provide uh, primary, primary source type information um, for the people that are uh, in a science class. And so real studies and real data is probably the key thing. Um, that's why I'd also recommend the BioInteractive website, um, which I posted in the chat message. Um, HHMI um, biology resources, fantastic studies, um, uh, very data driven um, and, and really important. And they have a, an interesting way of layering studies in that website. You can study one theme um, by, by doing a, a course of study with them. And each time you're re-looking almost at the same experiment, but with a fresh set of eyes and developing an understanding. It's really, really awesome uh, website. The other thing that I would be careful of, and of course in our environment, we have to be careful of this. Um, this is a lesson based on adaptation to the environment. And that gets into you know, the potentially tricky subject of, of evolution. Um, and at Thales, you know, given our belief in the dignity of mankind and, and the Imago Dei, you know, I think it's important to note that um, in a study like this, we can talk about change over time evolution in terms of the small adaptive changes to the environment that are well documented and well uh, studied. Um, but I would encourage um, that we should not be getting into stories or studies of, of origins of, of people or anything that in some way um, diminishes the special value of humankind and makes them nothing more than an animal. Which is why you know, I gave a kind of cagey response to the question, do humans follow this trend? Um, I mean, the, the answer is yes and no, um, because there's an aspect of humans that's biological, but there's an aspect of humans that's distinct and, and unique as well. And I don't want to blur the lines there. So uh, those are a couple of things I, I keep in mind um, uh, when, I'm picking, when I'm picking resources. Well, Matt, I think we have time for one more question here. And I think this would be a wonderful one to end on. But what's your advice for engaging a large number of students with different levels of curiosity? Some, of course, may know a lot already, and others may not know anything at all. So, how do you teach, you know, the students that are, are go-getters, naturally excited, and the students that need a little bit of encouragement and exhortation? Yeah, it's a good question, and it's always a it's always a delicate balance. Um, I directly approach those who are hesitant to join in and invite them, invite them to think about it. I will use, maybe even use language like, give me a chance, <laughs> give me a chance to, to share something with you. And I'll come back to you at the end and see if, you know, if your attitude has changed about it. Um, so they kind of know um, my directly that and then the the go-getters sometimes you got to slow them down a little bit sometimes you got to say you can't answer this question let someone else do it um, um, but I think uh, to answer the question more directly 
there needs to be a level of excitement about the study. It needs to seem important to students. It needs to seem like something that they should, that they should want to know. That's where, that's where engaging them begins. When the teacher makes the student feel like this is an important lesson. When the student, uh, or when the teacher makes the student feel like they should, they should want to know this. Um, or when the student is so captivated, you know, by the, by the, uh, the idea um, that, it, that it can change their, their demeanor. Sometimes it takes time though with those students that are hesitant, you know, it can take time, it can take um, repetition um, and it, it can take encouragement um, in order to get them more involved. Um, but it's always important to keep an eye, I think, on, on the, that, lower, that lower group um, in terms of engagement and be deliberate about, about seeking them out, um, encouraging them, working with them. And even if it's just incremental improvement, I'm gonna champion it. So I will, if I say to a student, I'm gonna come back to you and find out, even if they show a slight improvement in their intellectual curiosity about a subject, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a big deal out of that and make it seem like a, a giant win. Um, that's not a very concise answer and I wish I could give you like precise rules to follow. Uh, I think what I'm saying is a lot of it's about relationship with the students and making them feel like what they're studying is important. I see you're having trouble there with your, with your lights, Mr. Brady, that <laughs> they have, have gone out. Um, I think we've got to the end of the, of the questions that I see um, typed in as well. Um, so again, if you go back to the beginning of the chat message, um, I believe there is a, a link um, to a Google document that uh, contains a lesson plan with further links for the presentation and the, and the worksheet um, that I adapted from Biology Corner. Um, if anybody would be interested in, in doing a lesson like this in their class. Well, Matt, thank you so much again. We'll include a link to your to the Google Docs document when we send out resources for today's webinar. Uh, Matt, this was just fascinating, though. This was such an enjoyable way to spend to spend an afternoon, and uh, I'm just really thankful for your time and putting together this presentation. Just trying to connect the values and virtues of classical education with the pursuit of truth, beauty, and goodness as we see it in the natural sciences. Um, I do wanna invite everyone to our next webinar, which is actually tomorrow, April 8th at 3 p.m. It's entitled Great Books, Great Teachings, Great Teaching. And it's with myself and Josh Herring, who's the assistant administrator at our Thales Apex campus. And this particular webinar is focusing on literature and how great books contribute to character development and uh, how they, the unique role that a uh, that literature plays in a classical curriculum. So I would love to see more people uh, for our webinar tomorrow, but if not, please reach out to me or to, to Matt Ogle. Um, if you have any other questions about resources, about teaching and pedagogy, um, we would love to just help you on your classical journey since it is all about the students. So thank you all again, and I uh, look forward to talking to you all soon. Have a wonderful day, and thank you all so much.